Today we have a phenomenal interview um, with my good friend Jeff, Jeff Holst. Um, I, I didn't know Jeff at the time, but this was a, a really fun interview. He talks about so much cool stuff. Jeff's a former um, bankruptcy lawyer who then turned to multifamily value adders, and that's what he's focused on now. But he also talks about so much more than that. Um, he was diagnosed with leukemia at one point, which unfortunately um, he, he beat that. Um, he talks about the, you know, the stuff that he learned from that. And he also talks about a really interesting thing about having never having bad days. That's his thing. He decided when he was 18, I think that he doesn't have bad days. It's just a thing, his mantra. So so much stuff to, to unpack in today's interview. Make sure you listen to all of it because it's really, really enjoyable. Um, as always, like and subscribe on Wrestling With Real Estate on the YouTube channel, on the podcast, the WWRE podcast. Give me a five-star rating and write me a review if you enjoy it. And also, it's available on WrestlingWithRealEstate.com. So enjoy today's phenomenal interview with Jeff. Welcome to Wrestling with Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multifamily real estate investor Barry Griffiths. And today we have a great guest. Jeff is with us today, all the way in Chatt Chattanooga. Oh, did I say that right? Chattanooga. Yeah. I always have trouble with that one. In Chattanooga. No, see, I can't, still can't say it. <laughs> it's okay. It's Chattanooga, Tennessee. There we go. It's like the we Chattanooga choo-choo. That's the only <laughs> thing we're known for. Okay, okay, cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Um, I'm excited about today's interview. We were just chatting beforehand, and Jeff has so much energy. It's just infectious, so already I'm, I'm pumped for this interview. So can you tell us a little bit about, about your background and about what your current focus is right now? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm going to start with the second part of that. Current focus is value add multifamily. I think that's where it's at. I love it. Um, and I do like uh, B and C class, um, sort of small and, and medium sized multifamily, like 10 to like 100 units. I don't compete with the big syndicators. Um, I, and I don't really compete with the mom and pop guys and, and gals because like they're, they're so, you know, you get about a million dollars and they get scared and they get above five and all the like hedge funds and stuff jump in and try to sap up all the good deals. So it's like my little sweet spot in the middle there. So that's my focus. Uh, my background's not in real estate. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I have an MBA. Uh, I used to do bankruptcy law. Uh, and I, uh, I did that from 2007 to like 2010 ish. So not very long. Uh, so really not a good use of my education dollars, right? Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tuition, 10 years in college so that I could do four years of law, um, which, uh, you know, it is what it is though, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you learn from your uh, life lessons. But anyway, that's my background. Um, obviously, there was a little bit in between there, but, but that's where we're at now. So Very cool. Very cool. Well, maybe talk to us about from 2010 to 2000, uh, 2007 to 2010 kind of sure. the craziness that you saw, you know, I wasn't around here. I moved here in 2010, but, you know, talk to people who may not have been aware of the craziness that was going oh, on. Oh yeah. So I lived up in Michigan then I'm from Michigan. I grew up there and, um, uh, yeah, I, look, I was an attorney and in 2007, when I came out of law school, the, um, economy was amazing, right? Like 2006, 2007 is like the peak of the market, right? Everything was, Honestly, um, it was the best economy that there had been since I maybe was like in, you know, elementary school and, and probably the best that I thought we would ever see in all of eternity. And so I made the really smart choice when the economy was doing excellent to like specialize in bankruptcy, right? Like no one was filing bankruptcy and I'm like, I'm going to be a bankruptcy attorney. Uh, and then the world fell apart. And so I got lucky, right? I mean, the, the um, economy um quickly turned around i mean there was the mortgage crisis that kind of popped the bubble but but there was an enormous turnaround i mean the town that i was in uh near grand rapids had a gm plant and the general motors plant closed down and then it just was like a 
it was literally like dominoes falling like these high paying jobs went away and then that meant people didn't go to restaurants and the restaurants started closing and then the convenience stores started closing and pretty soon everyone i knew was filing bankruptcy and we were filing i think we filed like 250 bankruptcies uh in 2008 uh and i would have done more but uh in 2008 in august of 2008 um i took a little time off i went to peru uh, and I went and climbed to Machu Picchu and it was like this great experience. And it was actually the last thing on my bucket list, right? We like made this bucket list in Europe uh, when I was 20. And, and now, now, you know, 10 years later, I'm 30 and I'm like crossing that last thing off the bucket list. Uh, and then a week later, I was diagnosed with leukemia. So uh, that distracted me, right, from, from practicing law. And, and a, a pro tip there, if you um, have a bucket list, you should make sure you don't cross the last thing off because you might get leukemia and that sucks. <laughs> so <laughs> try to avoid that. Just create um, a crazy list then, I guess, right? I, yeah, I, you need I, a really I, long list. Um, I call it a life list now. <laughs> I refuse to call it a bucket list because I just, I just don't want to die if I don't have to, right? Like I'd like to stick around for a minute. Yeah. And so... So I, I, you know, I was fortunate uh, in a way because the type of leukemia I have um, was very much a death sentence in 2005, but by 2008, they had come out with a new sort of experimental treatment. Uh, I got in on that uh, and I've been taking it ever since. I still technically have leukemia, but this drug is like a miracle pill. You take a couple a day and it keeps the type of leukemia I have in control and, and it's like, you know, it's like having high blood pressure or something. You just take a pill every day uh, and you're pretty much okay. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that because you get some side effects. It's hard on your liver and, um, you know, there's a little bit of nausea. If you, if you try to take it without a meal, like it's pretty bad actually. Uh, but but it, it could be a lot worse. I could be dead, right? Like <laughs> the five-year survival rate for a chronic myeloid leukemia, what I have uh, in 2000 was... Uh, like five percent, and now you know, twenty years later, the five-year survival rate is like ninety-seven percent. Wow! Which that's like basically the five-year survival rate of people, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like there's always a chance people die. Like it's slightly worse than like not having it, but it's not that much worse. So I'm very, very fortunate. But I had this period of time when I was first diagnosed where I couldn't work. And I didn't know what kind of leukemia I had. And we didn't know if the drugs were going to work. And I really thought I was going to die. Uh, my white blood cell count was really, really high, like 250,000. supposed to be like four to 5,000, uh, 10 at the most. Um, and so I was like way into the advanced stages. They said I probably had it for four or five years without knowing it, right? And it was completely out of control. Uh, and I really was near death. Like, I mean, I was in really bad shape. Uh, I knew that when I was in Peru, I wasn't feeling well, uh, but by the time I got back, it was very obvious. Um, I'd gotten a little bit of a cold in Peru, and uh, and I couldn't, I just, my immune system was screwed up from my white blood cells being where they were, and it just, it went downhill really fast uh, from there. But ultimately, that ended up causing me to file bankruptcy. So I stopped filing bankruptcies, right, and yeah. filed one more bankruptcy, <laughs> and uh, that was tough. I mean, a, a, a personal bankruptcy for yourself. Yeah, I did. I filed it for myself. I mean, I, I couldn't work in my firm. I had a small law firm. Um, when I was in Peru, one of my lawyers quit. So I went from having two lawyers, myself and one other lawyer, to zero, literally in a two week period. And uh, it cost $5,000 a week to keep the doors open. And we, we tried to dig out of this, but we, I didn't work for six months. Mm -hmm. um, and we piled up this huge pile of debt. And then we spent the next two years trying to pull out of it. Uh, but ultimately, it just it, it just was the economy where it was and then all of this debt that we had on top of it. Uh, and also, my energy wasn't that great back then. Like, I was still recovering. Um, and I just wasn't – I maybe, you know, maybe I could have been more motivated. I don't know. Like, you can go back and, like, second-guess yourself on this stuff. But one thing I know for sure is – you can't change what's already happened. You can only change how you react to it. And so I just try to focus on the future and focus really on right now and being positive in the moment. Um, and if you can do that, the rest of the stuff sort of works itself out. But yeah, I ended up bankrupt in 2010. Um, and I quit practicing law at that point. 
and I moved um, to Chattanooga, took a job for a small trucking company, uh, and I got paid reasonably well, and I got some bonuses. And so that's when I started thinking like, well, I need to figure out a way to have income, even if I can't work, like I might die, uh, I might get sick again. You know, we still didn't know for sure that we were going to beat it then, right? Still don't even know that for sure now, right? But I feel much more confident, you know, 10 years after the fact than I did two years after the fact. So, yeah. uh, in fact, I'm coming up on 12 years. It's unbelievable. Uh, in September, it'll be 12 years since I was diagnosed. And, yeah, but uh, I just uh, I just figured I needed to do something different. So I started buying real estate. It's something I was always interested in. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 19 and always was saying, hey, someday I'm going to invest in real estate. And eventually someday was like, if I don't do it now, I'm probably going to die. So I might as well do it now. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always ask people what's their motivation and what made them get into real estate. Right. And, you know, people have varying stories but you know to yours i think is definitely the strongest why that you could have right i think i didn't know how much i was going to live but so i needed to do this you know it's <laughs> i don't think it gets much more real than that yeah well i really wanted to make sure that my wife had something i felt like and she never said this to me and i don't even think she felt it right but i felt like she spent this period of time uh, supporting me while I was going through school, right? She had a job. I didn't. I was going to school full time. We were living off of her money. And the trade off was at some point in the future, I'm going to be a lawyer and make money. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be able to kick back a little bit and raise children or uh, do something that's following her passion. And instead, I went, not only am I not able to make money, but like, I'm not going to practice law anymore. And we still have a pile of student loan debt because that doesn't go away in bankruptcy. Yeah. And I just really felt like if I die, it would be like capping off the whole thing. And I'm like, here's a pile of debt. And by the way, you just wasted the best part of your life. <laughs> so I had to figure out a way to make sure that didn't happen. And I'm just really stubborn. And so that's why I was in real estate. Take care of my wife, take yeah. care of my family. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. You you have such an amazing attitude about it. You know, it's, you kind of joke about it and you can, you know, make, make light of it. But obviously at the time, I'm sure, you know, the whole situation, you know, the, having to file for bankruptcy, the, the leukemia, the, having the student debt, you know, a lot of people at that time would have just rolled over and said, I give up, I can't quit. But obviously that wasn't the case with you. You maybe talk a little bit about your, your mentality and your mindset at that time. How were you able to, to turn that around and be like, listen, I'm, no, I'm not letting this happening to me. I'm turning this around and I'm making stuff happen. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say it was, you know, super easy and that I just have this magic ability to make this stuff go away. But there's a couple of things that I have that are really helpful to me. One thing is I, I told you this off camera, but I, I gave up bad days when I was 17. Like I literally just one day I said, I'm not having any more bad days. And I woke up that day kind of having a bad day and I was looking in the mirror after brushing my teeth and I thought to myself, I live in America and that's not a bad place to live. And like, I'm healthy and I'm young. Like it could be a lot worse. I think today is going to be a good day. And then I went out and did not have a good day, honestly, because I just didn't, I didn't fully embrace it. And so the next morning I thought to myself, I have to fully embrace this. So I just started saying, and I don't know, maybe I saw something online or maybe I heard something on the radio. I don't even know how, where it came from, but I just said, to myself today's a good day today's a good day and every time i sort of created triggers every time i turned my car on i would say today's a good day every time i saw a mirror anywhere i would think to myself if i was in public today's a good day if i was by myself i'd say it out loud today's a good day and i did that for months all the time probably a hundred times a day today's a good day and one day i walked into a 7-eleven and the guy behind the counter says hey how you doing today and i said I never have bad days <laughs> just came out yeah. and then I went, Oh crap. It's true. I really don't ever have bad days and I haven't had a bad day since it's literally been like a quarter century. So that's amazing. That's amazing. I love those, all those little mindset stuff that you talked about there but, that, that might well, may have not been an intentional stuff. You may have not dived deep into the mindset stuff, but it's just tricking your brain, right? It's just like you tell yourself, yeah. 
you're amazing. Everything is fantastic, which for the most part, really, it is for most people, right? It's amazing. You're fantastic. You have a great life. If you tell yourself enough for that time, whether you believe it or not to start off with, your brain is going to get wired that way. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, there are people that have much bigger challenges than me. And it's true that I have bigger challenges than other people. I get that, right? Every single person has good and bad stuff that happens to them, though. And, and, and you can, and, and I think every single one of your viewers and listeners, and I'm sure yourself included, know people that think their life is terrible and you look at their life and you're like, mm, it's really not that bad. And you also know people that have terrible lives by objective standards and, you, and they're not thinking that. Like Stephen Hawking comes to mind, right? This guy, you know, he's dead now, but, but he becomes paralyzed in his youth with a disease that kills pretty much everyone in a year or two and he lives 50 years in a wheelchair not not able to move right and having to like communicate by breathing into a straw to move a cursor on a computer and yet he manages to like live a very full and enriched life and become like famous and i think if you asked him you know how's life right he's gonna be like i love being alive mm -hmm. because stephen hawking wouldn't be Stephen Hawking if he didn't because and like 99.9% .9 of people in that situation just give up and die mm -hmm. or, or even if they don't die it's because their body's more stubborn than their mind and they just sit around thinking about how terrible their life is mm -hmm. and and if you can do it if you're Stephen Hawking you can certainly do it if you're me Jeff Holst right I'm just I'm not I'm not Stephen Hawking like my my life isn't I think that sounds worse than what I went through and I met people like traveling all over the world. I've been very fortunate. I've traveled to many, many countries now. Uh, and I've met people that are really, really poor. People that make $10 a day. Uh, people that make a dollar a day even. That are some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Yeah, and true. then I met people that are really rich. Like I know people that are very rich that make me feel very poor. That are just miserable. So it's not like a money thing. It's not a health thing. So what is it? It has to be mindset. There's really nothing else left. It's how you perceive your re your existence that matters. Yeah, that, that's a great line. How you perceive your existence. That's just so huge. What you perceive, uh, you know, perception is reality, right? What you perceive to be true is true, 100%. Whatever that reality is to you. Um, I was similar to you. I traveled and I, I went to stay with tribes in Africa. And they were so happy. They had a great life. They had nothing. Not a single iPhone, not a single uh, kind of electronics, no running water, no ele electricity. But they were so happy because they had their family, they had a purpose in life, and they had each other, you know, had that community. And it was just amazing to see it. And I came back thinking from that was like, we call those people the third world country, but really, who's the third world country here? We come back and people are depressed because they don't have the, the latest iPhone or they don't have... I don't know, the biggest house. Yeah, the, my the, iPhone is two years old. Oh, no, what was me? I, and the truth is, there are people that, are, I mean, I don't know what tribes you were traveling with, but I was just in Africa this year in February, and I met Maasai people, and I met, um, you know, I met um, some other tribal people in Tanzania and stuff that, all sorts of tribes, I can't even remember all their names anymore. Some of them were really happy people like you're describing, and other ones were not. Right. And it tended to be the ones that were like dissatisfied were the ones that were looking over and going, look, these people in the city have, you know, internet or whatever, and we don't have internet. Uh, so there's definitely something about our culture, our society, our, our modern technology that makes this a little bit more difficult, right? It detaches us a little bit from our surroundings. But I think there's probably been people forever that are happy people and people that are unhappy people. Yeah. I think if you're a hunter gatherer caveman person and you find a berry, you might go, Oh, this is great. I found a berry. Or you might look at it and go, Oh, it's a blueberry. I wanted a strawberry. <laughs> right. Yeah. It just so doesn't true. seem, I don't think it matters. Right. I think it's yeah. just about perspective, even for that person. So. Yeah. So true. So true. Um, yeah. And that's the, that comes that, that part of this conversation was really interesting to me because yeah, mindset is so I know we were, I focus on real estate with this show, but mindset is such an important aspect of it. And I think as we all look for ultimately some form of happiness or becoming happier, right? That's why we're investing in real estate. That's why to create a better life for us to be happier, blah, blah, blah. Not that we're not happy, but you're always striving for better. And I think mindset along with, with so many 
great points that you've posted out um, mentioned today is important. But as we're wrestling with real estate, let's dive into the real estate stuff. First, sure thing. Right? So you said, so said you were working for a trucking company and then you, you wanted to get into real estate. What, was, what did your first deal look like? And how did you well, get Well, we it? didn't have any credit. Okay. And we were pretty broke. We didn't have a lot of money, but I had gotten some bonuses and saved up a little money. And we actually saved up $20,000. And it was all the money we had, right? That was it. It's $20,000, no credit. We're renting a house. We've got uh, a car that we're still paying on. Uh, my wife hadn't found a job yet in Chattanooga. And, and uh, so I got a call from my friend uh, from law school that was buying houses in Metro Detroit. So 700 miles from us. And he said, I got this great deal on a condo. Like we should go in on it together. And it was $30,000. And, and we needed about a $5,000, you know, renovation budget. So it was going to be like $17,500 each. And I said to my wife, I said, we need to do this. It's going to be a great deal. This, this condo was a foreclosure bank owned. Uh, a few years earlier, it had been a hundred thousand dollars, and I was like, "Just, just, it's got to be a good deal." Mm -hmm. And my wife said, "Okay, we'll do this one time, but if it doesn't work out, we're never investing in real estate again." <laughs> and I mean, I really had to almost beg. I was like, "We really need to do this," you know. And yeah. she's saying, "This is all of our savings. Seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. This is taking us like the whole time we've been here to save this up." And, uh, but it worked out all right. So we still own it. It's probably worth 150,000. We get, we don't owe very much because we did refinance at, at one point later. Uh, and it pro we get about $1,100 a month rent uh, on it. And we, we owe like 40,000 or something. And, wow. and yeah, and so it's been a really great deal. And we bought another one in the same building right around the same time. Uh, that was a little trickier because I didn't have any money left really. I mean, I was out of money and yeah. I didn't have credit. Uh, so I ended up borrowing money from my friend uh, you know, sort of like private money from a friend kind of thing. And yeah. that's what we had to do. It was like, well, I know it's a good deal. I already have one. It's working. So like, let's, I'm going to go buy this other one. And, uh, and that worked out well. And that, that friend of mine is partners with me in the other one. So he, he had, he believed in the deal too, but yeah. he could have just bought it himself. He did it <laughs> as a favor to me. Oh, really? Okay. He, he, he's partnered with me on both and he loaned me half the money for the second one. And then later we, we, we paid them back, but we also got, you know, we got loans on them and used that to buy a, a duplex. And then pretty soon we uh, got some other private money and we did some flipping to raise some money. And we just kept doing that for, that was 2011 when we started. By 2017, I was pretty entrenched in my job here in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. We had grown the trucking company quite a bit. So I'd gotten a lot of, of raises and bonuses and stuff. And then I helped them sell the company to a bigger company. And I got six months severance and I thought, I don't want to go back to work. Yeah. So we had about 50 or so single family units at that time. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we'd grown it quite a bit, you know, over that, you know, six year period. And I thought, I think I make enough money that I, I mean, we didn't take any money out for six years. Every dollar just went right back in because uh, we were living off of our regular income. And I said, I think I have enough money that I can make it the next six months because I just got the severance check and I'm going to see if I can just dabble in real estate a little bit more and uh, maybe I'll make enough to survive. And that's it. I haven't gone back to work since. So 2000, March of 17, I've just been chilling since then. Wow. Um, started buying uh, apartments uh, in uh, October of 17. And so we bought a 12 unit in uh, the first week, of October, a 19 unit in November, uh, a 32 unit in that next spring. And uh, since then we bought a 16 unit, a 12 unit, a 41 unit. Uh, it just goes on like that. And I got a 12 unit under contract right now. We just kept buying I mean, those. If I made a big mistake in real estate, it was not getting into multifamily soon enough. Mm -hmm. It's just a huge opportunity when you're in that value add multifamily space. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible though, to, to grow that portfolio to, to, to 50 units that quickly and I'm guessing you know start off with again you, you probably didn't have that much money it was leveraging other deals leveraging other people's money yeah um, lots of partnerships um lots of hard money uh, lots of doing value add stuff where we fix stuff up and w for a while we would buy you know a house in Detroit maybe ten thousand dollars put ten thousand in sell it for forty take the forty thousand and go buy a house we wanted to keep in a little bit nicer neighborhood mm -hmm. right so we just 
do, just flip a house and then buy a different house with it. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So then you guys got into your first uh, multifamily in o October of 17, you said? How, yeah, how, how yeah tw a 12 how unit. I did it with my dad. Uh -huh. um, yeah. I didn't have enough money to do it myself. I thought it was a good deal. I actually probably overpaid, but the market, again, good timing for me. This is like the story of my life. I'm just, I really feel blessed. I, I got into bankruptcy at exactly the right time. I started doing, you know, bankruptcies when no one else was. And then all of a sudden there was tons of them. I started buying real estate when no one else was buying real estate. 2011, the market was in a free fall. People were running and I was like, eh, let's just give it a try and see how it works out. And the market's been up like crazy ever since. And I bought the multifamily uh, October 4th of 17. I know that for sure. I remember the state because in November of 17, the president and the Republicans in Congress changed the tax law. Uh, they, they created bonus depreciation mm -hmm. and they backdated it to October 1st. Okay. So, so we got, we're going to owe taxes. I got this severance check. I was going to owe taxes on that. And I wasn't even sure how I was going to pay it. Cause I just used all the money to buy this real estate. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden I get this, by the way, not only are we going to make it really a good time to be in multifamily investing, we're going to backdate it to right before you bought yours. And so we got like, 150,000 in bonus depreciation we weren't counting on and all the income taxes that I owed went away and I ended up with a refund. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just dumb luck, right? It's, I, you can't even make this stuff up. And I think this sort of stuff happens to you if you believe good things are going to happen to you. I'm not like, um, I'm not like really into the secret or any of that like stuff. Cause I think a lot of that's kind of overblown, but I do believe if you look for opportunities, you find opportunities. If you look, it's just like, if you look to have a good day, you find good days. I mean, lots of people would say you were diagnosed with leukemia. That couldn't have been a good day. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was diagnosed with leukemia and that wasn't a good minute when the doctor told me that, but the first 20 hours of that day were actually pretty good. I got to call it like 10 o'clock at night and say, said, hey, you have to go to the hospital right now. Like you have leukemia. That, that, that's, that sucked. Mm -hmm. It wasn't great. Yeah. But the rest of that day was pretty good. And the next day I was like, eh, you know, I've had a good life. Like I'm going to figure this out. And I thought to myself, if I die, I got to see everything I wanted. I went to the Machu Picchu. I'd gone to Petra uh, in Jordan. I'd seen the pyramids in Egypt. Right? I'd done all this stuff that was on my like crazy, like 21 year old bucket list. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 30, if I died, I, I, you know, I would have, you know, I'd rather not, like I said before, I'd rather stick around for a while, but it didn't matter. Yeah. And I think, I think, yes. Yeah, so there's so many good things that you said that, but I think one of the things that I believe in as well is that you have to be open to, to opportunities, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the property that I bought in um, uh, Northern Kentucky it just came up, it just came through me through a broker that I'd just been speaking to the previous week, you know, and I was just out there still looking for properties. And, you know, it was just luck that it came to me, but it wasn't luck that it came to me because I was open to it. I was looking for it. I wasn't sitting at home saying, oh, there's no deals to be had, or I wasn't not taking action. I was just out there ready for deals. And because of that, it kind of came to me. And if you're not just like your situation, if you weren't out there willing to do deals, willing to make moves, nothing's you know what's going to happen nothing right but if you're yeah. out there doing deals you know you 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 just don't know the, the luck that you can get if you aim nowhere you're gonna get there like there's no <laughs> doubt about it and yeah if you tell people you buy apartments all day long every day and you go on shows and talk about how you buy apartment buildings it's amazing how apartment buildings just sort of show up yeah it's it's crazy i, I can't really explain it other than like you just open yourself up and tell people what you're looking for and, and they find it. People, people remember that too. Someday uh, I'm going to file it away, sort of in my subconscious, Barry bought something in uh, Northern Kentucky. And then someday I'm going to run into something in Northern Kentucky and I'm going to call Barry up and say, Barry, like, Hey, are you looking for more property in Northern Kentucky? I know someone that has it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 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 So, you, you know, that's interesting to me as well, that you went to a 12 unit with your dad. What, what made you switch? Because you obviously you had success, right? You had 50 units at that point and you'd had success doing what you sure. did. You know, and a lot of people, they would say, okay, keep doing what you're doing because you're having success. What made you want to change and what made you f feel comfortable to change? Well, so I, I felt that 
I had been reading about multifamily for a couple of years before that. So I had a bit of knowledge about it. I read, I mean, I listened to like all of the bigger pockets podcasts back then, mm-hmm. like every single one I was, there was like, at the time there was 300, I think they're in the four hundreds now, but I'd list, I listened to in one year, all 300 of them. And uh, I just like, cause I forced myself to do it. And that was the year I quit working. I'm like to this year, I've got to like absorb as much information as I could. And then just sort of filtering through that. I realized I didn't want to be a wholesaler. I didn't want to flip stuff anymore. I knew enough about doing single family stuff that I knew I could keep doing that. And I was going to still do that. And I still buy smaller deals uh, occasionally, but I've moved away from it in the last year or so because the, where the market's at now, those the prices on them are crazy. And at least in my markets, the ones I play in. And it's, so I'm selling them and using that, like we 1031, a package of 10 houses into a 32 unit apartment building. And 10 units for 32 is a good deal for me. But not only that, I can create appreciation there. I can, I can raise the rents. I can lower the cost, increase the NOI. And now it's worth more money. That 12 unit that we bought, I think we paid like around 600 for it. We recently had it appraised. So we've had it for three years, not even three years now. We had it appraised. We've got a refinance done on it. We pulled out more than our original down payment. Okay. Still own it. still cash flows. And I mean, I was there today. I, I don't go there that often, but I was there today because we put in a, um, a, a brand new parking lot because the parking lot was a little rough. Spent, I think, like $15,000 on doing that. And that came out of that refinance money. So not only did we get all of our money back, we had enough money to do additional repairs on the place. And every time we do that, we get more income because then people are like, Oh, it's nicer. And then they're willing to pay more rent. And then you get more money. It's it's like, it's like, it's ridiculous how easy it is. (laughs) And, and so I, I just love it. And once I realized how, how much control you had by, by doing multifamily versus single families or duplexes or something, it became really obvious that that's where I needed to be. And, and I, I like growing. I, and once I didn't have a job and I had the freedom to think about this stuff and spend time analyzing it, I, I dug in and I just kept moving forward. And now I'm, I told you at the beginning, I play in this 10 to 100 unit kind of deal, but most of our deals are like 30, 40, you know, like that range. I want to do 100 unit plus now. I mean, I'm ready to make that move, but I'm also very cautious by nature. Uh, We've syndicated a couple of deals, but almost everything we've done has been JV stuff, just a couple of partners. Uh, And there's something to be said, look, nothing wrong with having one or two or three or 5% of of a thousand units, but there's something to be said about owning a third or half of a couple hundred units. Mm -hmm. And, And the control you get is a lot different. And also when you're risking your own money, you can take bigger risks than I think you should be taking with other people's money. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. When, you know, if you're just partnering up with one or two other people and you're all um, equal partners and you go all have a similar risk tolerance, you can kind of go a little harder in terms of um, what kind of property you buy, you know, whereas if you have 20 investors that you're all, you know, you're, you're giving them an 8% preferred return that kind of uh, hamstrings you a little bit in terms of what you can do. It does. And, and some of the stuff we do doesn't have, I mean, it just, it's not, it might even be negative in cash flow when we buy it because we see the big vision mm-hmm. and we see where it can go. And you can do that in a syndication. I'm not saying you can't, mm-hmm. but it's, if you do those kind of deals, some of them are going to go bad. Mm-hmm. And I, I just don't want to lose investor money. Mm-hmm. I just, I feel like that's game over. Once you do that once, try raising money after that. Yeah. It's going to be difficult. And, and listen, I'm not going to call out names, but there are some syndicators out there. I'm skeptical about their deals and they benefited from a positive market cycle. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the market cycle because I know how lucky I got when I started investing, I got in at the right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I've read all the theory. I've talked to literally hundreds of people about market cycle. I've even interviewed like some really big names on my show, like Harry Dent, who's an economic forecaster. Uh, I don't agree with everything he said, but, but I've listened to enough of this stuff to feel that we're toppy, right? Like, I don't know, like it's frothy, like it might go up again. It might still go up, but I'm not going to buy stuff that doesn't cash flow really conservatively. 
uh, and I'm not going to buy stuff that I'm banking on appreciation right now because, and, and I'm putting long-term financing on things. I, I just, I, I don't know. The rates are stupid cheap. I'll pay a little bit more and I'll lock it in for 10 or 15 or 20 years rather than have to risk refinancing in a recession. Yeah. 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 I, th I think what you're saying is so right. I think the syndication models become so hot I and mean, you've got some good ones some really successful some great ones yeah that are doing fantastic jobs and are doing um their investors a, a, a great service by giving them great returns but also i think there's people that have snuck in there that's just they're out to make a dollar and because you know a, a rising tide raises all ship right they've been lucky that it's been the golden era of apartment investing over the last five years yeah you know, and it might continue. I'm not, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, yeah. I don't have a crystal ball, but yeah. if the, if it keeps going up, those people will be fine. But mm -hmm. if we hit some blips in the market, there are some people that are going to be in a world of hurt. Yeah. I, and uh, I feel bad for their investors more than I do for them. Cause you know, these guys aren't risking any money. That's the other thing. If you're going to invest with someone, wow, check how much money they put in their deal. Yeah. Right. If they're not putting their own money in, like you got to really wonder. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And doesn't, I mean, I get that. Not everyone has a bunch of money. I've done deals where I don't put money in. I, I get that. Sometimes you have to do that, but, but make sure they have a good track record. Make sure there's a good story. Make sure the property seems right. Make sure everything lines up. It's not passive. People say all the time, I want passive investments. Invest in a, a bank account. If you want passive investments, get a CD or something. Uh, real estate's not passive. It's more passive if you invest in someone else's deal, mm -hmm. but it's not passive. It's just sort of passive, you know, it's not quite there. You've got to really do some due diligence on your own or you're taking way too much risk. Yeah. I think the work is done up front, right? And uh, yeah, investing passive. You, want, you want to check out the deal, but more importantly, you want to ch check out the deal sponsor and kind of what their track record is, who they are as a person, what deals they've done, what, you know, you just want to get to know them, like, and understand who you're getting in bed with because. Yeah, no like and trust. That's the key. You, yeah. you got, you have to. And the problem is, since most of these syndicators go to these same conferences, they know what to say to sound good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and it makes it easy to, and they're likable people. I don't think they're even bad people. They just don't know what they don't know, right? So you can know them, you can like them, you can even trust them, but you also have to, they also have to know their deals and you have, that's, that's the hard part. Uh, there are lots of, uh, honestly, some big name syndicators that I have concerns about some of their deals. Like I look at their underwriting and I go, uh, that's not how I would do it. Now, they might know something I don't know. Right? <laughs> so that's the other possibility. Yeah. I just, you know, I have a finance background. Uh, and so I maybe dig in a little bit deeper than the average person on that stuff. But yeah. Well, you, you mentioned it there. You mentioned the market cycle. Now you've done a lot of research on the market cycle and interview people and whatever. Give us, give us a little bit of maybe an insight of how you see things and what, what, you, what you're thinking. Because you're obviously still, still buying, right? I think you said you've got a yeah. 12 unit that's going to be under contract. The 50 so. units this year, actually. So the, we've done 38 already. We have the 12 unit under contract. So we'd be at 50 units this year. And I'm not done. I mean, I'll still buy if I see something else. Mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, Market cycle is not this, I mean, so there's a misnomer here. There isn't one market cycle in real estate. Um, there's a difference between different asset classes. I would be very skeptical about buying um, small specialty retail space right now, mm -hmm. except for maybe like, you know, gyms and karate studios and stuff, they'll probably be okay. But like, if you're looking to buy like electronic stores or something, I'd be really careful about that, right? That's to me, that seems like something Amazon's gonna kill and the COVID's gonna accelerate that. Uh, restaurants are another one I'd be really careful about. Um, offices, I'm really careful about right now. And I, by the way, I have exposure to these. I own an office building with a couple of partners. I have a retail strip mall with a couple of partners and ours are okay, like they're doing fine, but I'm not looking to increase my exposure to that part of the market unless it's a specific deal because that's the other thing even inside of those asset classes, there are different geographic markets and there are different, um, even, even, even different specialties, right? So some offices, you know, are, you know, the big high rise skyscrapers, those are, those are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Those are going to need to be repositioned. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you have a small office building in a rural community, that has a lawyer's office in it or an accountant or something, 
the lawyer's probably going to work from his office. He's not going to want to meet people at his house. He yeah. needs an office, right? So that, that might be a great investment. And so you have to not think too much about the market cycle. But uh, the answer to your question is the market cycle comes in four phases. Uh, it starts in phase one, which is like uh, an expansion type phase. And then it goes to a hyper supply phase. Then it goes to a recession. And then it goes to a recovery. Uh, if you think about it like uh, quadrants, I, I know some people won't be able to see me making the X with my uh, hands because they might be listening on a podcasting app. But but if you think of it like quadrants um, and you number them one, one to four, uh, the stuff above the line, the one and two quadrants, uh, that just means occupancy is um, – what that really means is occupancy is above the long-term historical averages. So you could take like apartment buildings in um, Las Vegas. I know you're in Las Vegas. So apartment buildings in Las Vegas uh, have an average occupancy of, let's just make up a number. I don't know what it is, but let's say it's 95%, right? Mm -hmm. if, if in Las Vegas right now, all the apartment buildings have 98% occupancy, then you know you're either in expansion or in hyper supply. And then the way you tell between the two is if it's on the one side of it, uh, the occupancy levels are falling, on the other side, they're going up. So if occupancy is at 97% and it's going down, you're in hyper supply. If it's at 97% and it's going up, you're in expansion. You want to buy sort of like at the beginning of expansion, end of recovery and get out before recession if you're going to try to time the market. But honestly, I always tell people buy whenever, you know, buy when you buy, sell when it's high. That's mm -hmm. sort of my tagline for that. Like it doesn't matter if you buy at 2006 and you sell in 2010, you're in trouble. You buy at 2006, you sell in 2019, you made a whole bunch of money. Yeah. So if you if you have long term goals and you buy something that's cash flowing and you have a nice margin, so if rents go down a little bit, you're still going to be okay. If you have a little bit more vacancy, you're still going to be okay. And you have long term financing in place, so you're not going to have a callable loan, um, and you have enough cash on hand, you can mitigate the market risk by just waiting it out. Real estate's very forgiving over the long long term. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that's great values. You know, if you don't have to sell, you're in a great position, right? You like how I you like how I dodged where we are in the market cycle. <laughs> with that. Uh, I want to finish answering. I, was, I, I realized I did it. Um, I, I think we're in hyper supply, we were, but maybe more insight into what you think is going on with the economy. Maybe right yeah. now, you know, like well, it's tough. Yeah, the economy is really tough right now because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. I think we're in hyper supply, and I think in uh, I think that's true for most of the different markets. And I think it's true for most of the different asset types, but they're not completely aligned. Um, office buildings, I think are worse off than apartments. I think multifamily apartments still have some legs left. Um, and I think by the way, they don't go up and down as quickly as, um, as, as, as single family houses and stuff. Foreclosure rates during the great recession on a multifamily, like agency debt, multifamily, a million dollar plus loan balances were less than a 10th of a percent. Mm -hmm. It's really not that bad. Um, but at the same time, single families were six, 7%, you know, that's by the way, math wise, that's 60 or 70 times more likely to be foreclosed on. If you had a single family house, I had my single family house foreclosed, right? I filed bankruptcy in 2010 and gave up my house. Wow. Right. But if I had had multifamily at the time, I would be fine. I would have paid my mortgage payment. The multifamily would have supported it. So I think if you have long term financing, don't worry about the market cycle. But if you're buying to try to time the market cycle, probably wait. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And it's just, you need that cash flow, right? You need to underwrite conservatively, you know, allow for a good amount of vacancy, maybe a little higher vacancy in future. Who knows if you want to, you know, allow for that in there and some maybe, a, you know, higher insurance, maybe higher taxes, but you know, if it's still cash flows after you all do all these numbers and you can get great financing now, it's, it's oh, unbelievable, unbelievable financing right now, right? With, with the rates that you're getting, um, it, it makes sense to buy because you should be in this for the long haul, right? If you're in this for a quick turnaround, maybe multifamily isn't the space for you, but if you're in this for the 10, next 10, 15 years, at least, you know, you'll, you'll come out on top eventually. I think so. Yeah. As long as you, like you said, as long as you underwrite correctly and, and account for those risks, 
I mean, you can do flips in multifamily. It's possible. I know people that do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, underwrite those conservatively. Make sure you're going to put a lot of money into it in a short period of time. You can make big money. It's just like, you know, flipping houses. You can make a lot of money, but that's a job. That's not an investment. Yeah. And it's the same thing with multifamily. You might, if you buy a 150 unit building that's vacant and you fix it up and rent it out, that's a lot of work. It's mm -hmm. not an investment. It might be a thing that makes you a ton of money. I'm not saying that, but it's a, it's, it's a very high paid career at that point. Yeah, very true, very true. Well, this show is called Wrestling with Real Estate. Um, so now we're gonna get into some wrestling themed real estate questions. Okay. So we'll, we'll start with a tough one. What would be your wrestling, if you had to come up with a wrestling name, what would your wrestling name be? You know, I saw a couple episodes of your show, so I knew that you did this. <laughs> and um, and I, I've been struggling with this because I'm not very good with wrestling names. <laughs> yeah. But listen, I'm, I, I think it'd have to be something like, um, you know, I guess it would have to be something with comeback. I hate to do something cliche and say like the comeback kid or whatever, you know, <laughs> but like, that's really my life. I just, yeah. you know, uh, I think we'll just call me Jeff. I think we'll go with that. Jeff, Jeff, the yeah, comeback just Jeff. Kid. I like the comeback kid though as well. Jeff, yeah. the comeback kid. you can have a real name, but also yeah, something like that. Yeah. Jeff, the comeback kid. Okay, cool. Well, in, in wrestling, everyone has a special move, right? Everyone has a special move. So what is your special move in real estate? What is your strength in real estate? Okay, so those are two different questions now, uh, but I'm going to answer them both. So my special move is something that it's, I almost don't like talking about it because I'm afraid people will steal my idea and not give me credit for it because it's so <laughs> awesome, right? It doesn't have a name. I've got to think of a name. So if you got anything for me, Barry, let me know and we're going to okay. brand this. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I find value add multifamily deals and I get a couple of my partners to join to we'll form a company to buy it we'll put it under contract and i'll get an operating agreement together where uh myself and maybe one of my other partners have like 40 percent of the company each so we get like 80 percent between the two of us then we get a couple other people to own like 10 percent of the company and then loan that company all of the money needed to buy the deal and fix it up okay Right. So, so then we pay them interest from the company. So it's kind of like a prep rate, but they're active investors, right? They're participating in everything. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a mini syndication, but not a syndication, right? We're not selling a security. The, the company is being formed. They're loaning money to their own company. I mean, obviously run it by your attorneys before you do this stuff, <laughs> but, but, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to get into these sort of smaller non-syndicatable deals you know without putting any money in or putting a very little bit of our own money in and having the company borrow the money from our other partners in that deal uh and it's great for our in our investors you know our, our partners um because they get to go into the deal uh get some interest on their money and when we refinance those deals because they're value add mm -hmm. we pay them off their money they still own 10 percent of the deal whatever they keep it forever until we sell they get all the 10% of the tax benefits, 10% of the income, everything. Cool. Let's call that the secret structure. The secret structure. Okay. Secret we'll structure. call that that for a working, working title. Uh, <laughs> not quite like a chop or something like you were doing at the beginning of the show. But, but, uh, but my superpower actually is related to that. Okay. Um, my superpower is I'm really good at structuring stuff. Like I am, I'm able to explain complicated things in a simple way for people. And, and that way I can, I can help them understand what's in their best interest. And then by doing that, we can figure out a way that works for everyone involved in a deal to really, and so we do some really creative structures like the one I just told you, the secret structure. Um, but there's other, you know, there's other, other things that we've done that are just different than what other people do. Uh, and it's just because I'm, I'm, I'm really able to understand how to balance everyone's interests and figure out a way to come up with a deal that's really good for everyone. Cool. Cool. What's been the biggest body slam you've taken in your real estate career? Well, listen, when I lost my house, it's really the worst, right? Because that you, what that does for you, and of course it wasn't a real estate investment at the time, so it's a little different, but what it does for you is it makes it very difficult to borrow money because you have a foreclosure and a bankruptcy on your record. Like if you think about that, that's the really hard part. That's why it was so hard to get 50 units in that six years. And my bankruptcy 
goes off my record in December of this year. And I'm so happy. <laughs> you have no idea that it sticks around for 10 years. And I'm like so ready for it to be gone because I'm constantly having to explain that away. Even now, I, I constantly have to tell banks, well, you know, I had leukemia and I had this small business and, and I, and you know, they're getting more and more understanding as time goes on because it's further in the past right? And my net worth has gone up. So I'm less of a risk in the, than I was then. Uh, but also uh, what's happened is, you know, they just see that I, I know what I'm doing and I've, I've, I've taken steps to make sure that never happens again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, was there a moment you were standing on the top rope, getting ready to jump into the real estate ring, but you were scared? What was it? How did you overcome it? Well, I mean, my biggest mistake was not getting started soon enough. I spent, you know, a decade of my life reading books about real estate and like watching like Carlton Sheets, no money down infomercials and stuff. And uh, rest in peace, Carlton. He just died this year, actually. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I wanted to be in real estate forever and I never did it until I got sick. So, yeah, I mean, there was like a decade I stood on the top ropes. That's longer than anybody in history, almost, it seems <laughs> like. I just stood there looking down going, this is the promised land is right there. All I have to do is jump in. And I just never did it. And I wouldn't have probably ever done it if I hadn't gotten sick and thought I was going to die. Because then what do you have to lose, right? I was already bankrupt and dying. Like, what else do I have to lose at that point? No more risk. Yeah, there's only up from there, I guess, right? Yeah, well, that's how I looked at it. So, so I mean, that's probably it. But, but I mean, there are specific deals. Like when we first got into multifamily, I bought this 12 unit uh, and then the 19 unit shortly after that. And then we were under contract on a, a 48 unit. Uh, and it was just like a month or two later. And I just kind of was like, this is a great deal. I know it's a great deal, but I just didn't have the, like, the mental fortitude to push it to the finish line. And we backed away from that. Um, so so, you know, that was standing on the top ropes and then never getting in, right? Like I just walked away and I regret it now because I know it was a great deal, but also if I hadn't taken that pause, I might've gotten overwhelmed yeah. and I might've collapsed. Yeah. And that's the lesson of, of my bankruptcy firm. I, I was growing too fast and then something happened that shocked the system, something that I couldn't predict. I didn't know I was gonna get leukemia. And I wasn't able to recover from that blow because I had expanded too quickly. I had bought too many phone book ads. I bought too many com television commercials. I had too much support staff, right? And it was just, a, it was a big pile of expensive crap, frankly, because of that stuff that did me no good. And that's why I think when COVID happened, I'm like, eh, whatever. Like, I'm, I'm sad that like people are sick and dying. I, I, I don't want to minimize that, but a lot of my peers in the multifamily space were freaking out going, what if like people don't pay their rent? And I'm going, I always thought that might happen. I didn't know what was going to cause it, but, but I'm being really conservative. I'm just not going to worry about it. Like, yes, I, I will be sad if I can't collect rent, but we've done things to mitigate that risk. We spread out over different markets. Now, granted, it was an international event, so I didn't spread out that far, but we also went with some subsidized housing, like a significant proportion of our of our tenants, we get a check from the government. Well, you know what, that rent came in every month. It still comes in every month. It doesn't matter if those people are unemployed or not, like we're gonna get that check. Um, but I don't want all that because they might change the program. So we have conventional tenants too. It's just about, you know, trying to balance that stuff. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Well, thanks for sharing all that um, today. It's been a really, uh energetic and you know really cool uh, interview today to hear about you know a lot of the mindset stuff that maybe we know but we don't use enough I know maybe I don't um, you know but it's, it's trying to work on that every day and you know your success in real estate how you've just managed to make stuff happen you know I think that's a recurring theme with successful people that they'll find a way you know they figure it out as they go and they're going to make it work no matter what and I think that's definitely the case with you that you you know that you've had all this success because you've managed to make it work so um, thanks for coming on thanks for wrestling with real estate oh and before we go where can everyone find find you? I'm glad you asked um, really so <laughs> uh, the best place to find me is probably last life ever on Facebook so it's last life ever uh, it's a Facebook group, private Facebook group, but if they request it, we'll let them in. Uh, we got about 1,100 people in there now. It's growing every day, though. Uh, and what I do there is we have um, 
uh, we basically just help people live the best version of their life possible. So it's not even a real estate group, right? Um, there's a lot of real estate people in it because I know a lot of real estate people. My partner is a syndication attorney, uh, so she knows a lot of real estate people. But it's really just about living a full and complete life. And if you go in there, that's where I spend most of my social media time these days. So if you want to get my attention, you go into Last Life Ever, you post there. But if you really want to find me, jeffreyholst.com works well, too. Uh, cool. Yeah. I got my website up and you can send me a message on there and I'll, I'll respond. Well, I'll put, I'll put all the links in the description below. Um, but yeah, like I said, thank you so much for coming on. And oh, I forgot something. Oh. I have to, I have to stop you, Barry. So like yeah. your show has got a great name wrestling with real estate. And I think that's really, really smart. Um, it's the second smartest name in all of shows. <laughs> what's, you what's, know what the what? smartest name in all the shows are? <laughs> what? Old fashioned real estate. Old fashioned real estate. Have you seen this? These guys, they they uh, drink bourbon old fashions uh -huh. and talk about real estate investing. So they get <laughs> drunk on YouTube and talk about real estate investing. And by the way, these guys are me. <laughs> Just to be clear, I'm pitching my other show real yeah. quick a second here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so old fashioned real estate, you can find me there too. Cool, cool. I'll put all the links to that below. So yeah, if you guys go check out those shows like you can see. As you can tell, Jeff's a great guy and I really enjoyed, today's our first time meeting, but I really enjoyed talking to you. Such a infectious, energetic personality that, you know, it's so much fun to talk to you. And obviously you've had a lot of success as well. And you have a lot of tips that people I think can, can learn from watching this interview. So you provide a lot of value in that aspect as well. So yeah, I really appreciate you giving us the time to share your stories. Thank you for having me on, Barry. It's been great. Cool. Thank you, Jeff.